This is Gareth Jones on Speed, episode 497, which means that we are dangerously close to episode 500. To celebrate this auspicious occasion, if there's anything that you'd like to hear again or you'd like us to do for the 500th episode, drop us a line and let us know. You know the email address, onspeed at garethjones.tv. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Hello, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth. He's Zog. Hello. And uh, Zog, you probably sound the same as normal because you're in the usual position, but I'm, I'm sitting in the conservatory at the moment, so it's probably going to sound a little reverby here. Okay. Slightly different ambience, yes. Yeah, that's, yes. The, that's it. Yeah, the room ambience. I'm, I'm being baked in the conservatory. You know, they're too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, and too bright for most HD screens. I'm struggling to see what I'm looking at here. Oh, that's, a, that's what you're dealing with. But very nice to be able to lounge around on a uh, slightly sunny afternoon like today, maybe. Yeah, it's very nice here in North Wales at the moment. And it was very nice to sit here on Sunday and watch a very nice Grand Prix. We've been treated to a bunch of races recently and the Hungarian Grand Prix was an absolute belter again, wasn't it? Oh, no, absolutely delivered. We had tremendous drama, a little bit too much drama, some oh, yeah. people might say. Uh, no, it's some great racing, a tremendous battle in particular between Lewis and Max. Uh, that was a great little scrap. I get slightly marred by some of the behaviour. Again, we'll, we'll get onto that in a bit more detail. But yeah, overall, yeah, tr- tremendous race and also a weekend that uh, kept everyone on their toes with the changing weather. So really, you know, it was n- never looked like it was going to be an easy weekend or an easy race for anybody. But in the end, we got a wonderful McLaren 1-2 slightly marred uh, by the way the, the team handled it, the way the drivers handled it. But, yeah, hell of a race. Yeah, it wasn't an easy win for McLaren. It perhaps should have been because the general agreement is that they've got the quickest car at the moment. I say this week, it seems to be changing every fortnight. McLaren had the advantage... Piastri was second and Norris on pole. Lando was on pole, uh, but Piastri got him at the very start of the race when they were three way into uh, into turn one, Max, Lando and Oscar. And that gave Piastri the team advantage over the race. They favoured Piastri for the win, I believe. That was the understanding. Whoever led into the first corner would then have preferential treatment when it came to pit stops which is what happened isn't it they pitted them in a strange sequence Norris and Piastri well they pitted them as you say in a sequence that might have surprised some people in that Piastri was leading the race normally you would give the driver who has the advantage the call on the pit stops and where there's a strong undercut as at Hungary they would tend to want to pit first retain the advantage this is not what happened at the second McLaren pit stop where, presumably because they were worried about Max Verstappen uh, catching the uh, the McLarens, they pitted Norris first in order to protect him. That then gave him an advantage over Piastri after the round of pit stops had shaken out and Norris was ahead. And we then had the drama slash slight fast maybe of McLaren trying to shuffle their drivers back and just you said a moment ago that you know your understanding was that McLaren had you know said or they had a rule that whichever driver came out of turn one in first place would have the call on pit stops would be you know the the favourite driver for the race I don't know but it seems to me that that was very definitely not clear within McLaren you know that the the difficulty was you know what went wrong was that they were not sufficiently clear as a team about how they were going to handle a situation like the one that transpired where one of the drivers was leading the race 
and then because of a decision the team makes that disadvantages that driver and puts the other driver ahead, you might then want to shuffle them back because, yeah, because Oscar had done what he needed to do to lead the race, you know, two thirds of the way through the race, he is ahead, you then effectively shuffle Lando in front of him because of the pit stops, but you want to give the deserved place back at the head of the race to Oscar Piastri. That would seem entirely sensible from a team point of view and driver management point of view and something that teams have done many times before, but it clearly wasn't, you know, spelled out clearly enough to the drivers how that might be handled, how that might be dealt with. Uh, Yeah, yeah, the team wasn't clear enough earlier on, apparently. It was messy, wasn't it? Because there was an ongoing dialogue for, I don't know, five, ten laps or something between the pit wall and Lando, where they were saying to him, Lando, you need to slow down to let Piastri pass. And you could see the reasoning in, in Norris's head. Man, I'm leading this race by six seconds. If he wants to pass me, tell him to go quicker. I'm not going to slow down and jeopardise everybody catching us up. Plus, why didn't McLaren favour Norris in this situation? I don't know what the points difference is, but surely Norris is a greater threat to Max losing the championship to a McLaren driver than Piastri is. Isn't Norris ahead on points? Lando is the McLaren driver who might be able to challenge Max for the championship. On that basis, arguably the team should favour him. That said, you could argue that, you know, it's so unlikely that he's going to win the championship that really that's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a red herring to introduce that argument and you should give your drivers equal treatment. Now, I think for a team that aspires to be, you know, the best and for drivers that aspire to win the world championship, that would be a poor attitude to take. That would that would really not be trying hard enough. You know, you want to try and win that championship. So, you know, the fact that it's a right it's a distant prospect isn't really a thing. On the other hand, you do need to maintain harmony within your team. But also, you know, you need to treat your drivers fairly and you need to keep your drivers happy. Yeah. If going into that race, the team had said, Lando is the one who can actually challenge for this championship. We want to have Lando finish first and you second because we want the points for the drivers' championship. If they'd said that going in, yeah, I'm I'm sure Piastri wouldn't have been happy about that. You know, but I dare say he'd have he'd he'd have accepted it. As in the end, Lando accepted the team order as it was in the end to move over. I didn't think he was going to, because it was what five laps from the end. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I was. um, uh, I thought he was probably going to going to stick it out. Yeah, it, it, it certainly felt like it for you know for a while. He really didn't sound like he was going to do it. Yeah, and you can see his perspective. You know, if yes, I will move over for Oscar if he can catch me up. If he's quick enough to catch me up, yes, I'll move aside. If he's not quick enough, well. He's not doing the job. You've put me at the front of the race. I'm going to win this thing. I can absolutely sympathise with Lana's point of view at the same time as thinking that the team was, was, was right to ask him to move over for Oscar and that he was right to do it. I don't think it means that he doesn't have what it takes to win a championship at all. The interesting thing about this is that um, this is the big story, what everyone's talking about and bothered about post-race. And it, it, it really doesn't reflect well on either McLaren or Lando Norris. You know, the team missed, in a sense, a fairly obvious bit of management here, management strategy. They kind of dropped the ball in in quite a big way, arguably. They should have been ready for this. And Lando looked really petulant and yeah. whiny. Yeah. And But I think they are both big enough to get over it very quickly. I think McLaren is, you know, I don't think it's going to have any, I, I don't think there's going to be any, you know, long-term fallout from this. I think Lando is very good at getting over this kind of stuff quickly. You know, it may bother him at the time and piss him off, but I think he very quickly he moves on to, okay, that happened. It's in the past. Yep. Let's get on with the next thing. Let's deal with the next challenge, next race. Put it behind us. You mentioned Norris being a bit whiny and complainy there. He wasn't the only one. How yeah. whiny and complainy and awful was Max Verstappen? He was accused of being childish what, over the I mean, radio? Yeah, what? I- 
Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, the FIA should have got a couple of teachers from a local <laughs> kindergarten to <laughs> deal with the drivers in this race, honestly. Yeah, no, I mean, 100%. Again, Max Verstappen, he did not sound like a supremely self-confident, talented world champion. <laughs> yeah, no, he was, he was really out of sorts. He was, as you say, whiny, yet yeah, childish, as the team called him. And... It seems that the the threshold for him getting that bothered isn't actually that high. You know, it's not as if he was really having a terrible race, whatever he was complaining about over the radio. At least he was fighting for third place. Sure, he wants to fight for first place, but it wasn't as if he was, you know, halfway back down the field because of a catastrophic decision the team had made or, or something awfully wrong with the car. You know, but he's sounding really bothered that has to be taking up some of his headspace some of his attention and we saw him make a very clumsy stupid incompetent move on lewis uh do you know what yeah, it was comical. i'm uh, i'm reminded of what it was like having two small sons as a dad when they were little you know if ever any of them was hungry or tired things would pop you know we would never have a family argument before dinner Make sure that you eat first and then everyone's a bit calmer, a bit less tense. Make sure everyone's had a good night's sleep and people will be a lot less tense. And the reason I say this is that Max was spotted awake at either 2 or 3 in the morning before the day of the race running a simulation, a 24-hour endurance race, wasn't he? Online, a virtual race. Oh. What the heck was he doing up in the middle of the night? No wonder he was tetchy on Sunday. I bet that this whole tension thing comes from that, that I bet the team, someone in the team has mentioned that to him beforehand, and that irked him. And being tired, he was easy to be irked. That's my theory. Do you agree? I may maybe. Maybe, but uh, he, but he really, you know, he could. Uh, I don't know. What, I was going to say he needs to change his attitude. Or, I, I, he's doing okay with the attitude he has, I guess. Uh-huh. But it is interesting that that the pit to car communication was as fraught and tetchy as it was, because it seems like the relationship between Max and his team hasn't been as harmonious this year yeah. for a couple of reasons uh, that aren't entirely to do with on-track action. Uh, yeah. Maybe the, we, that relationship is not as strong as it has been. Maybe it is a little fraught and maybe that's going to have you know implications for the future. I'm reminded of a, a chance that they have in a sport that we don't follow, that football sport called football kicking or soccer ball or something. I've, I, I've, I've heard of it. Yeah, they, they, there's a chant which um, you hear in the crowd sometimes, which is, um, you only sing when you're winning, sing when you're winning. You know, they're <laughs> not winning, and that has changed the whole countenance of the team. I mean, they're only just not winning. They're just off the podium, right? But they're used to dominating at the moment. So this must feel really uncomfortable for them in the team. We'll come back to Red Bull and the rest of the season in in a moment. But this whole drama, the tetchiness over the radio between Max and his team, the tetchiness over the radio between Lando and his team, overshadowed the fact that Oscar... Piastri got his first Grand Prix, and I don't count the sprints, his first Grand Mm -hmm. Prix win. Wow, that's going to change everything, isn't it? Yeah, and we've had several different race winners this year. I think more than we might have expected, given Red Bull's form at the start of the season. And now we have another. Yeah, fantastic to see Oscar Piastri get that first win. Uh, And, you you know, he's been looking quietly confident, you know, for a long time, he's you know said he expected you know he knew it would come eventually, uh, and and it has come eventually. You know, good for him, and he just drove absolutely beautifully, um, nailed that start, and he did everything he needed to do to win the race. The second round of pit stops meant that he ended up behind Lando Norris, and he wasn't. You know, to be fair to Lando, you know, in that last stage. You know, Piastri was not quick enough to catch him. He he wasn't catching Lando. Yeah. Uh, and now whether his you know tyres were maybe just not in quite the same shape or uh, whatever the exact nuance of it might have been. Yeah, he he wasn't quite as quite as quick. But had the 
second round of pit stops followed a more normal process where they'd have pitted the leading driver first then Piastri would have just led from start to finish and been fairly untroubled by everyone behind him so yeah he drove a great race he deserved it I don't think we've heard the last of this I think going forward in the rest of the season there are going to be more occasions in future where Oscar and Lando are on the same piece of track because they're in an equal car with more or less the same ability to drive it at more or less the same speed. We haven't heard the last of this. I'm concerned for McLaren that it will spill over into a bit of argy-bargy between the two drivers on team as each try to assert themselves. Okay, I don't think that will happen. No? Well, we'll see. You know, I'll be interested to see, but Lando, I think is quite good, as I said before, at at putting things behind him, Uh at at moving on. And I think that this is not going to be a thing that will, you know, really bother him for the rest of the season. You know, it will certainly bother him if he loses the Drivers' Championship by six points. Oh. (laughs) And it will certainly come up in discussions then. But other than that, I think no, I, I, I think he is, you know, smart enough to understand that. Yeah, th- th- this is a team game he's playing. He does need the team, and very often he does need his teammate. You don't win a race on your own, and I don't think it will bother him. He's not going to forget it, but I would be surprised if it actually bothers him for the rest of the season. Well, see, I'm not going to miss it from now yeah. on. I, I said in the last show that, you know, I was a little bored with Formula One this season initially because it seemed like it was going to be a Red Bull whitewash. But now there are at least two and a half other teams in that race. Uh, McLaren and Mercedes have bounced back. Lewis has bounced back. Didn't Lewis drive a great race that's why I'm so happy again you know there's more than one player in it and my favourite player Lewis is back in it oh yeah and we saw a magnificent display there of just how good Lewis Hamilton's judgement is in very tricky racing moments when Max was chasing him when they were fighting for third place and there was this, you know, this period where yeah, Max is catching up. You're wondering whether Lewis is going to be able to keep him behind him. You know, when is Max going to make the move? And you know, Lewis just judged absolutely beautifully his breaking uh, into. I can't remember which right hander it was, but it was just, you know, absolutely as late as he could, and you know, just locking up, going into the corner. He couldn't have done any more to slow the car down without sending it off, and that was enough to keep. Verstappen behind him and keep his momentum going. No, he just judges these things beautifully. And we saw in that fight with Max, his skill and judgment on display just beautifully. The championship as it stands at the moment, just looking at the points, Max has got 265. Lando is at 189. You've got Charles Leclerc at 162 in third place. Carlos Sainz, fourth, 154. Oscar Piastri down in fifth in 149. I can see Piastri tightening up and passing Carlos Sainz, possibly Charles Leclerc too, and giving Lando a run for his money. And if Max continues to finish third and fourth as opposed to first and second, he could lose that lead in the championship. And now it's on, isn't it? As they say, it's on. Oh, it is on. Absolutely. And we're going to see this McLaren Red Bull fight continuing for the rest of the season as you say but we shouldn't be surprised to see Ferrari winning again Mercedes winning again yeah, maybe someone else can get in there in the mix you know this 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 season's turning out to be much more unpredictable than it looked at the start so yeah let's hope we get more of the same bring it on and bring on Belgium oh it's going to be good in Belgium I hope it rains oh yeah yes uh, Soggy lovely talking to you say bye Bye-bye. Good seeing you, man. And speak to you after Belgium. Will do. Bye, brother. Bye-bye. You're a chosen speed! If you were listening to one of our Le Mans shows this year, you may have heard something that I said while sitting in the stands at the Circuit de la Sarre, that it was a great shame that Lola were no longer at Le Mans, or indeed in any motorsport. They used to dominate 
In IndyCar in America, they helped Mansell win his championship as well as a number of other people. They've been in endurance racing. They've built cars for Formula One teams. They even had an abortive attempt at being in Formula One in the early 90s that ultimately killed the company. But now, Lola is back. They recently announced that the brand, which has been acquired by someone new, was going to enter Formula E. Now, one person who did hear me mention this on the programme was on speed listener and car designer himself, Nia Khan. Nia got in touch to say, Gareth, I know the man who is Lola's sporting director at the moment. Would you like to talk to him on the program and find out their plans for not just joining Formula E, but other motorsport series as well? I, of course, said yes. And this is the conversation that I had with Mark Preston, who explained what the plan is. The company is now owned by Till Bechtelsteimer, and he has an interesting vision for the, the future of Lola, based around, you know, when Lola was obviously last competing, very much about aerodynamics, chassis, and that kind of thing. But motorsports changed a lot over the last 10 years or so. I like to say from when I first started doing V8 supercars in Australia, when everything was about more power and revs and, you know, there was no thought about the future. Nowadays, obviously, car companies and, and motorsport teams have to think about everything. There's not just one fuel or one energy carrier, as I like to call them, um, that's going to go forward. And so to get a little bit technical, uh, we're looking at three pillars. So we're looking at electrification and Formula E, obviously, um, world championship. So it seemed like the best, uh, the best way forward in that respect. So we're the manufacturer of records for Formula E, so it'll be a Lola car as, as officially named in the sport. The next pillar is hydrogen, and that's why I was at Le Mans this year and we missed each other, but having a look at the, at the future of powertrains and, and everything in, in Le Mans. And then the final bit is sustainability in fuels and materials, and so they're the three pillars that we're looking at, but uh, you can imagine that the future of motorsports is a lot different, you know, Back in the day, you'd probably just get a V8 engine and you know, put a throttle cable through to the front and, and basically a gear change mechanism and that'd be your car. Um, but nowadays it's all-wheel drive, um, regeneration, electronics, you know, software. It's, it's a completely different game than it was back when Lola was running last. Well, motorsports has changed, but so has Lola. This is a very different version of the brand that existed previously can you explain the, the story of how lola has got to the position where it is now it went bankrupt in when was it 2012 was oh, it yes yeah uh, martin brain um, uh, shut down the company um and then obviously he sadly passed away a few years ago and his family looked at where it would go next and and till got involved a couple of years now looking at what the future might be um and as i say because the you know if you look at our traditional competitors that would be delara and, and others we can't just walk straight back into motorsport and, and compete straight away with Delara that's obviously doing an amazing job around the world and, and in so many series. Uh, Lola's been out of the game for long enough that there's different competitors on, in the landscape. And so when we looked at how would we differentiate ourselves in the future, it came down a lot to where are the areas of, of future development, which is electrification, and that includes you know hydrogen, obviously, any hydrogen car in, in Le Mans would also include a large amount of electrification in order to get the efficiencies required to compete with an internal combustion engine. So it, it's logical that um, when you start to look at how can we differentiate ourselves, that you head towards what we can see as the future. You know, with F1, obviously, 2026 going super electrified, um, all of the LMDH, LMH, obviously having a large component as well of electrification, it seems like, well, if you're going to come back into motorsport, you go where you can be competitive. I've been working in Formula E for the last 10 years, 10 years probably is when you count, you know, the pre-seasons and when we were planning for it, and prior to that in F1, so had experience of obviously a lot of software and technology in, in those areas, and so it's logical for us to then say, what is the future? It's all about sustainability, it's all about electrification and alternative powertrains. And that's where, you know, we can make a difference. And certainly that, that's where we're headed. Tell me about the way that Lola will run the Formula E team. 2025 you're joining. Next year, starting in actually in December. So the first race will be in Sao Paulo. 
and um, the, we'll be operating with the team uh, APT, uh, the German team who's had a lot of experience in Formula E and, and actually who I competed against quite a lot over the years in Formula E. So that was my next the, question, yeah. <laughs> It's been quite fun getting to, you know, we're actually trying to figure out and here we're trying to big net ourselves a bit by saying how many races and championships did we win as a sort of a competitors against each other um, when we reckon it's above a quarter of all the races and, and championships. So, you know, yeah. the, 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 the dream team comes together, hopefully, with uh, with all the guys from, from Lola and, and the guys from APT. You've got a technical agreement, a supply agreement with Yamaha too, or is it just a sponsorship and technological support? Are they providing hardware? It's a technical agreement and they're the powertrain partner. Formula E is a little bit different than other series. There's not a constructor, it's more of a um, we are the manufacturer of the car, in inverted commas, that's what it defines the total package. So Lola is leading um, on the, the design and integration and software side of things with Yamaha supporting in all of the the powertrain development. Um, they're a very interesting company. I did actually work with them, funnily enough, back at Arrows in the in the day as we were talking about your shirt earlier. I um, mean, 97, it was a Yamaha in the Arrows. So kind of full circle in that respect. Um, so they're getting super, you know, detailed into the design and understanding of electric powertrains and especially those in Formula E. As you know, it's 350 kilowatts, very similar to a Formula One. Uh, electric powertrain obviously an f1 um, powertrain will have a different requirement um in 2026 but still pretty high power and high efficiency motors so yeah yamaha is completely embedded in with us um we've been going for 18 months now it's funny it takes a while to develop a full new powertrain and software so we've been working together now for quite a while and it's uh, quite an exciting project to work with yamaha are you daunted by dropping into a series which is pretty mature now with a, a number of manufacturers, teams, what do we call them, uh, who understand the mechanics and the maths of competing in Formula E. This is not an easy task, is it? No, and I think that's, a, that's you know, to that point, it's also the same in coming into any series. And I, you know, I, I feel for any big car company going into, let's say, F1 or into Le Mans or in, in any series. And But I think we've done a great job at it. Um, I, I don't want to predict, you know, where we'll be next year. I must say that the the dyno tests, the, the first shakedowns and those kind of things are going along quite well. We keep saying touch wood, touch wood, because, you know, <laughs> you know, motorsports is, is tough. And, and as you say, it's going to be difficult going into a series with obviously Porsche and, and Jaguar just finishing their, their their battle over the weekend, which was obviously quite exciting. Um, if anybody hasn't watched, it'll be a good one to watch. Um, so the answer is yes, it will be um, difficult. The good thing is APT has obviously run at the front uh, over the last sort of nine seasons, ten seasons of Formula E. I've had experience from the beginning, won multiple championships, so we know what it takes and we also know how much um, work those guys have done while we've been away. Um, our lead designers and, and, and other people in, the, in our team at Lola have all done Formula E, so have had experience in various teams and designing powertrains and obviously Yamaha has been in motor racing and know what it takes to win at the, at the highest level, but also know how hard it is, obviously, um, with their with their current um, their team having a challenge at the moment. But you know they were they know what it's like, and, and so it's good when you're working with a with a partner that understands motorsport. So I'm um, a long way around of saying it's going to be difficult, but I hopefully we're all going in with our eyes open. It's clear to me with your heritage and your track record in all branches of motorsport, particularly Formula E, this is a serious assault on formula e but lola it, it it's just a brand isn't it now is it just a name or is there have i missed something here what's the relationship with multimatic and lola because i know there was a connection isn't there over the years i think you know lola's worked with you know historically i'm, I'm myself trying to catch up with all the different you know companies that lola's worked with the traditionally over the years at the moment, we have designers, simulation, software in Lola. That's the you know the main core now. As you probably know, software is paramount in Formula E, and so that is a large, large focus of, of what we're doing. So what Lola is doing is being systems integrators, I suppose, is probably the best way of saying it, because you've still got to integrate software, powertrains, cooling, all the aspects of understanding a Formula E car and, and writing all the software to do with energy management, software strategy, um, all of those elements that build up to a modern Formula E car. So 
we're not doing chassis. You know, that's not currently the you know the the thing that Lola's doing. But as I said previously, we couldn't just come into back into motorsport and compete doing chassis because there's a lot of companies that now do do chassis, and you know many of them. In, and Multimatic is one of them, obviously, who does a great job in in Le Mans and other in other series. Um, so we're starting in the area where we think we can be differentiated, which is software, electrified powertrains, new energy. We're doing a lot of work on hydrogen in the background, looking at preparing for how that might come into to motor racing in the future. So it's a lot more about, I suppose, modern powertrains and the systems integration required. Again, it's not just is an internal combustion engine anymore. It's there's an internal combustion engine. There's two electric powertrains. There's a whole lot of software. There's energy management. There's all these other things that now make up a modern race car. So hopefully that answers your question that it's not the same Lola as it was. But I'm sure as we start looking into kind of a, a, a Le Mans comeback, there will be opportunities to work on chassis. But also, again, in, in Le Mans, it's a lot to do with these quite um, sophisticated powertrains that are now going into those vehicles. I'm going to come to Le Mans in a moment yeah. <laughs> but the key question before that is where's the money coming from where's the money coming from well yeah. we, we got partnered with yamaha and obviously we'll be looking to do more partnerships with other technical partners along the way in in all the series that we're working on so um yeah as always it's about sponsorship and technical partnerships and other elements that bring together how you go motor racing is it a uk based firm now Yep, we're based in Silverstone, so we've actually, uh, the, the tunnel is still, I think it's now operational again, uh, so the tunnel's been brought back up to speed, so it's still in Huntingdon, it, it hasn't moved. Oh, it's the same tunnel in Huntingdon? Yeah, yeah. I know that <laughs> tunnel, oh my gosh! So do I, we did the, develop the Super Aguri Formula 1 uh, car there in, in that tunnel, so... Uh, Yep, there's been a lot of history in that tunnel, so it's up and um, operational again uh, just recently. And then because, again, over the last 10 years, well, 12 years, I suppose, the centre of where all the designers and everybody, you know, operates out of now, Silverstone seemed like the best the best place to be in the centre of, you know, all the F1 teams and, and everything. So we have a factory unit there and looking at how that might expand um, on the site uh, that is Silverstone. How long is the commitment? Is there a two-year, five-year, ten-year plan slash budget? We are currently doing what they call Gen 3 Evo, which is the next two years, and then we're committed to the following Gen 4, which then goes on for another four years. And so, yeah, that's this is just the start of one program, and, and you know, we'll be looking at working with other OEMs, etc., on hopefully other programs. Well, as you know, I mentioned at Le Mans this year that I felt that Lola should be back at Le Mans. Lola have a superb tradition of running cars at Le Mans. I've watched many of them. I remember what became the Aston Martin Lola. I remember mm. the MG Lola in the uh, 675 class, I think it was called at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, how many chassis Lola have produced for Le Mans over the years? It, it's something that is written into the very identity of Lola after... Formula E, what's the priority? Is Le Mans going to happen? Is there an intent to happen? And what's the plan, if there is one? <laughs> so, as I said, the, the second pillar of Lola for the future is looking at hydrogen. So, I was there this year, as, as you were, obviously, and looking to just understand more about how the rules are shaking out with the FIA and ACO. So, that's coming together very well so we are you know quite closely following that and and, and working on a plan in that respect although that is uh, as you know sort of 2028 20, 29 so there's a little bit of uh, a gap there but um i also went to see you know what other opportunities there might be and as you know they announced the lmp2 tender might be coming out um in the future so of course um that was interesting on on the friday uh, that announcement so of course i'll be following that um intently and looking at you know is there anything we could be involved in in, in the lmp2 side of things but always there's other manufacturers that are not there LMH is obviously still a possibility, um, but I'm not sure how many more manufacturers there are to, to join in that respect. Um, but I've always found in motorsports, if you put yourself in the right place, opportunistic things happen. And, and that's what we've been doing by being at uh, Le Mans the last uh, two years, just checking out what's going on and, and getting um, ourselves back up to speed and understanding exactly what's the future. This sounds very, very, very ambitious to me that's not a criticism right that, 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 that that's quite the opposite ambition as Buzz Aldrin name dropping clang said to me once Gareth aim for the stars 
and you'll clear the fence. So, you know, <laughs> aiming for the highest echelon means that Lola will certainly get over the fence. But in the past, Lola has suffered from being a little ambitious. The whole MasterCard entry during the Eric Broadley period killed the company, forced the mm. company to be bankrupt. When A1 Grand Prix commissioned, what was it, 52 chassis from mm -hmm. Lola, they delivered that. But then beyond that, the rock set in when Lola chassis weren't as competitive as Reynard and Swift in IndyCar or Champ Car, whatever it was called at the time. Ambition, Ambition is something that is part of Lola's heritage. Are you not concerned that this could be too ambitious? I mean, <clears throat> motorsport has changed a lot as well since then. I don't know if you remember when Super Aguri entered F1, there was this one window that opened up to enter and Aguri said, shall we do it? And we realised there was a couple of weird things that had happened at that time when Basically, they got rid of the 107% rule for some reason. I don't know why. And it was the year we, we arrived and we said, well, we'll be 5.5 seconds off the pace, but we'll, we'll catch up to the, to the pack over that year. And so we said, but we'll be able to qualify. It's not like the old days. Um, and, you know, we caught up to about a second off the pace and we're in the top 10 by the end of the year. I think you've got to set a strategic intent, understand the rules. There's a lot of things that have changed in balance of performance nowadays. So there's different approaches to motorsport. Um, I think, let's say, the powers that be recognize that in those times, yes, you could have a Lawler and a Dallara and a Swift and a something else, a Reynard in the series, but it was quite easy to end up with only one manufacturer. And that's not healthy for a sport. So I think What's changed over the years is I think the organizers of, of racing have realized that you've got to make the sport sustainable in, in all elements, otherwise uh, there won't be a future for it. So I'm sort of answering your question in a different way to say that the things have changed and we're very wary of those things that have changed. And yeah, it's not quite the same as going into F3 back in the day and you brought two cars and hoped to win a championship. Actually, I started in Australia oh, 40 years ago now with an Australian Formula Ford where we broke into the series, but it took us five years, I think, to break in, and, and they still sell those cars now, the Spectrums, uh, around the world. But it's a big job to break into a series, and so um, I'm very aware of that from what I've done in the past, and I know how difficult it is, but I think it's now we've got to be wary of what's changed in the rules and, and understand those rules a bit better as well. you got the support of a large board of people who are committed to it who's driving this uh, pun intended who's driving it who <laughs> who is the one person who said to you right this is going to happen this is how we're going to do it till Bechtelsheimer he's the uh, new owner of the team he's a an avid racer he races in IMSA he's currently racing in the GT World Challenge yeah I'm not sure if he's racing this weekend but um you know he's he's a, an avid racer and so understands racing quite well done many of the series over there so well in well involved in the in the team and and the group of people around us growing all the time i wish lola well i'm serious i'm genuinely serious i've said that if there is a great motorsport brand missing from the landscape at the moment it's lola i think lola carries something i think even people who don't follow motorsport will know that lola is a race team or a race car manufacturer it's second only in terms of British history to the likes of you know, Lotus or Williams or, you know, can we mention yeah. in the same breath as McLaren? Mm. We're going to see those glory days again, Mark, or am I just fanboying here? <laughs> I hope so. I believe that we've got a good package to, together for Formula E, so it's a, it's a great starting point, and I think there's lots of opportunities in motorsport. I think, you know, you would say as well, being at Le Mans this year, it just seems bigger and bigger. I'm it's not sure huge, what your opinion it? is. <laughs> it's vast. I, I didn't recognise the scale of it, and I'm used to the scale of Le Mans. It seems to have doubled in the three or four years since I was there last, and uh, I think this is a good time to get noticed. It, 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 what, what's more important to, to Lola, Formula One or Le Mans? I think Le Mans. Yeah, definitely. It's the place that it's the place we need to come back to, and I think that there's a lot of opportunities coming up, and I, I think we'll be at the right place at the right time, and um, yeah, hopefully we'll be back sooner than you know. Are the boss's pockets deep enough? 
I think what you're going to look at now is we're, we'll be partnering with with OEMs. Um, we won't go in it alone if we're just we're not just going to enter you know Lola's LMH or something like that. But things like the tender coming up in LMP2 and other you know possible partnerships that, that you know could come about. Um, supporting other OEMs that are either in it or you know want to come in to Le Mans. We're there as we always were. So I think we'll be focusing on um, uh, finding those partnerships to go back to Le Mans. So we won't be going back just as you know Lola trying to win the outright trophy. <laughs> I'd, I'd love if that happened. I'd love it. Um, how many of you are there? You're the sporting director. You have a what? The finance manager. You have logistics. You have. Bit over, I think if I looked at the email list now, it's probably about 30 of us at the moment and oh. growing um, all the time. Yeah, it, it takes a fair bit to do Formula E, design, software, you know, build, test team, all those kind of things. And so you will see some news about our testing program sort of break uh, cover a bit more over the coming weeks. And so, yeah, I've got to have all those elements to go to go racing. And in terms of the heritage and I'm going to say brand exploitation but i think exploitation is is the wrong word i think mm. brand awareness how much are we going to hear about the heritage and traditions of lola you know your pr guys will be talking to you about this or is this a completely new lola no we will we'll be um blending in that over the over the time period we first wanted to start with something new which is obviously the the formula e program is the first sort of new rebirth of Lola and then we'll start blending in the, the history into the, f- the whole thing going forward so you know the T70s and Mark 1s and all the other interesting cars that have been along the way that you probably know better than me all the different um, the different marks um, so yeah when the, when the time is right we'll be starting to blend in that heritage with the future. One of the things I've always said is that there should be a Lola road car if there's no Lola race car there should be some kind of road going i mean that, that's out of the question at the moment isn't it you're not geared up for that sort of thing i mean uh, historically i don't believe lola ever did a, a road car and that made it possible uh we believe for lola to sit behind beside many many brands behind or beside actually you know when you look back at ford and honda and and others that aston martin as you said earlier mg so many of the the big brands have sat beside or or um beside lola and that sort of answers your question about how we'd like to go back to Le Mans is partnership with uh, OEMs rather than us, you know, going and trying to be a McLaren or something and, and do road cars. So I think road cars are out of the question for the moment because they always have been. And we'll stay true to that for the moment and um, focus on going back to Le Mans. I just realised something. This is um, in some ways a flip of Lola's position historically. In the past... Lola largely built cars for other teams to run in series. I'm thinking about Le Mans more recently. I'm thinking about one yeah. make series like A1 Grand Prix. I'm, you know, they were branded uh, Astons and MGs and what have you. But this version of Lola, this is the opposite. Rather than Lola sort of sneaking in via building cars for someone else... In some ways, this is someone else building cars for Lola. Would you say that's true? Um, I think, you know, if you look at some of the history, um, obviously the GT40 is a good example, isn't it? Where mm. it was a... That was a Lola? Was a Lola that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that formed the basis of a future program. So I think we still take the same viewpoint that this is a Lola car at the moment with Yamaha powertrain. But you never know how that might play out in the future, whether or not there's another OEM that comes along and says, we'd like to partner with you guys. And Lola can take the name off the car if necessary, um, because that's that's historically what uh, Lola's done. So we will stay true to that sort of historic uh, angle where sometimes, as you said earlier, it's hard for a, a car company. And there's a lot of car companies in the world that don't have traditional motorsport departments mm. uh, because things have changed over the world. And we have a lot of new car companies, obviously, out there. Um, that, are, that are coming along and haven't done motorsports before. So I think Lola's in a good position to kind of get the ball rolling and then just like the just like the GT40, it can switch and become another car. We don't mind. That's that's um, part of Lola's history. So just just this is the current way we've found that it's the, uh, the easiest way to come back in and, and the right time um, with the right partners like Yamaha, et cetera, and that's, uh, that's how it's worked this time around. But I think there'll be lots of different ways we could approach it in the future. I value the time that you've given me today mark because i know that you've probably got deadlines that you have to hit and targets that you have to hit at the moment to get the car ready for formula e 
what deadline scares you the most at the moment? What have you got to hit? What's the most pressing one? I think it's the car's looking pretty good um, at the moment, hardware wise. That's all going well, and I think it's just it's really a software game in Formula E, and so it'll really be just um, getting the software. We've got until December seventh, I think it is, to have every to be at a point where we're happy, you know, to to go racing. Obviously, a lot of testing in between, a lot of simulator sessions and those kind of things. So I think first race um, rolling out the the software versions and, and you know actually on track when the when the rubber hits the road will be the the, the challenge then. Mark, I cannot wait for Lola's rubber to hit the road. I wish you well in Formula E. I sincerely hope we get to see you in endurance cars again soon. And uh, I sincerely hope I get to talk to you in a paddock somewhere. Sounds good. Mark, thank you for finding time to talk to me today. Best luck to Lola. Big up the Lola Massive. (laughs) And stay in touch. Keep me posted. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of Gareth Jones on Speed. But before we go, here's a flashback to a song that I wrote for Gareth Jones on Speed way back in 2008 about my desire, even back then, to get Lola into Formula One or back into every level of motorsport. Yeah, it's not the Kinks song, Lola. It's an entirely different song, but sung in the style of Ray Davis and the Kinks. I'll leave you with Lola. See ya. Well, there's a racing market steeped in history Started by a guy called Eric Broadley One day in the morning with that Ford GT Then he built his own cars as fast as can be called the Lola The worst. Mastercard didn't pay up the bills. Eric had to swallow the bitterest pill. A nice of Lula, a formula too far. A log came a blow from the Middle East. Who isn't at a place at a Bedouin feast? Commissioned some cars, 25 at least, like an F3000. this show then please like share and subscribe for information on how to contact the show see pictures read song lyrics follow us on social media or to sponsor this podcast go to garethjones.tv gareth jones on speed is made in wales by whiz bang